Okay. Um, I'm just going to try it. Share my screen now. Here we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, Alrighty, so um, the paper that I chose today is called Protein and Chemotherapy Profiling of EVs Harvested from Therapeutic Induced Senescent Triple Negative Breast Cancer Cells. So these authors are actually from Dublin, Ireland, which I thought was pretty interesting. I'm not sure if anyone uh, knows these guys or collaborated with them, but they are at the Institute of Biomolecular and Biomedical Research School of Medicine at University College. Um, and their paper was published in Nature Oncogenesis towards the end of 2017. Um, it has an impact factor of about five or six if anyone's interested. Um, so it's a pretty well. So the reason that I chose this paper is actually because I haven't really studied uh, senescent uh, senescence and cancer cells in, in combination with EVs before. And I thought it was actually kind of interesting the concept around senescent cells releasing, senescent cancer cells releasing more EVs. Um, and so there's this idea that senescent cells uh, still have, or if not, have more of an influence on the local and distal cells through their EVs. Um, the other reason that I actually chose this paper is because it's completely cell culture based. I'm sorry if anyone was wanting it to be more interesting, um, but I'm just basically catching up on the literature at the moment in terms of cell culture and EV experiments. So I thought this would get a good opportunity for me to do this paper. Um, yeah, so um, before I go into the background for the introduction, um, I'll just quickly outline kind of how I'm going to do it so you guys all have sort of an idea. Um, so I'm going to briefly cover the background um, and in case anyone hasn't read the paper, I'll just go over like the really important points that you need to know for this paper. Um, and then I'll go figure by figure, I think, and then I'll, as I go figure by figure, I'll incorporate the um, results, methods and discussion into each figure so that um, I think that's the most efficient way to do it. Um, and then within each figure, we could try and sort of open up the discussion. Sheree might be able to get the comments going in the comment section bar. So if you've just joined, um, feel free to um, type in anything, any ideas that you want to add or anything like that. Um, the other thing as a disclaimer, obviously I'm not an expert so if I, and I'm not that familiar with this topic. So if I do put my foot in it or like, say something really false, um, just someone just interrupts, get me straight, whatever. That would be cool. Um, yeah. All right, so let's get into the background. Um, so these guys are really interested in triple negative breast cancer. So this represents about 10 to 15 percent of breast cancers in Ireland, which I think is about the same globally. Uh, this subtype of breast cancer is not compatible with hormone-based therapies. So as we know, this subtype is negative for estrogen, uh, progesterone, and HER2 receptors. Uh, PTX, or paclitaxel, is the chemotherapy agent used to treat this subtype of breast cancer. And at low doses, it induces apoptosis, but at high doses, um, and this is important to know for the paper, um, PTX directly targets alpha tubulin and the cells are stopped at the G2 end phase, so they can't progress through that cell cycle. Um, and this breast cancer subtype is also characterized by early onset and a generally poor prognosis, so this can be partially owed to chemo resistance. Uh, we need to talk about senescence and therapeutic induced senescence, so if anyone's not that familiar with senescence. Uh, basically, it is a cellular phenotype where the cells are um, they're still metabolically active, but they don't proliferate. Uh, senescence and cancer is kind of like a double-edged sword. So um, on the one hand, um, for normal cells, senescence is actually a way for the cells to avoid malignant transformation. But on the other hand, um, 
it can actually, for cancer cells, it can actually promote cancer development um, through altering the microenvironment and the cells can actually evade uh, therapy induced apoptosis. Um, chemotherapy and other treatments can actually induce senescence in cancer cells. And the bit that we are interested in is that senescent cells release more EVs than non-senescent cells. So the idea is that senescent cells still communicate with local and distal cells, and so they might be able to pass on those chemotherapy resistant profiles, etc. Um, so these guys um, only use, so one thing to note is these guys only use one cell line in the study. And that's a Cal51 cell line. So this is a triple negative breast cancer cell line. It's derived from um, an adenocarcinoma, but it was actually from um, the metastatic, a metastatic lung site. So I think that's something to note. Um, a couple of other characteristics I can think of is this cell line is wild type, so P53, and there are no BRCA mutations involved. Cool, so um, I'll just touch on the objectives that they stated in their paper. So this is actually just quoted from the paper. So they wanted to investigate the chemotherapy and protein content of EVs derived from TIS Cal51 cancer cells. So TIS is just therapeutic induced senescence. And then they wanted to determine whether the resultant profiles may partially explain um, if cancer cells remain viable despite chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic um, challenge. Um, cool, so if everyone's all good with that, I will go straight into figure one. So figure one, PCX induces senescence in Cal51 triple negative breast cancer cells. So the aim here was to develop and validate their uh, TIS model. Uh, so what they did is they treated the Cal51 cells for 75 nanomolars of PTX for seven days. Um, and then they measured four markers that indicate senescence. So in A, they looked at senescence-associated beta-glycosidase. So this is a lysosomal enzyme. And the idea is that senescent cells increase in size. And so they end up accumulating beta-glycosidase. Um, from this assay, they also got their senescence-induced efficiency, so this was 77%. And B, they have the KI67 immunohistochemistry, so this is proliferation marker, um, and you can actually see a larger cell is quite obvious there, so that morphology of the cell. And C, they do a Western blot analysis of P16 and P21. So these are cell cycle inhibitors, um, and in combination, these um, proteins are actually quite good to distinguish between um, senescent um, cellular phenotypes and other cellular phenotypes. Um, and then in D, they stained the cells with propidium iodide and did uh, flow cytometry analysis to assess the cell cycle distribution. So you can see um, quite a change there in terms of that. Um, so I guess I'll um, jump in with my thoughts on this figure. So I think they obviously knew that um, these markers are not perfect individually, they're just indicators of senescence, um, particularly the beta glycosidase. Um, and yeah, so they're not perfect. So KI67 can um, stain um, G2 cells on occasion, but I think in combination there's like enough evidence to show that they are senescent cells. So um, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, the only thing I could possibly add is they didn't report their um, cell death percentage. And I think this come, becomes a little bit more important later on. So we can touch on that again. Um, because, you know, with the PTX treatment, they would expect a lot of um, cellular debris and that kind of thing. Um, and it wasn't quite clear if, the, uh, if they had a vehicle control, so they can anything added to it. And it's not quite clear what PTX is 
dissolved in. I couldn't quite figure it out, figure it out myself. Um, yeah, does anyone else want to add anything to that figure? Um, I wonder if I can get the um, the comment tab back. There's no comments in that, Sheree? Yep, there's no comments. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Awesome. Thank you. I guess we'll go on to figure two. Cool. So figure two, uh, T cells release significantly more EVs than control cells. So the aim here was to assess EVs released from senescent cells. Um, so it was the same thing again. The Cal51 cells are treated with 75 centimoles of PTX for seven days. Um, and briefly, what they did is they isolated their EVs from the cell culture media through differential centrifugation, um, or sorry, just ultra centrifugation for um, the size and concentration they used NTA, nanoparticle tracking analysis. And then they also did a Western blot of um, CD63 HST CMT as positive markers and calmexin as their negative marker. Um, to go into a few more details just in the method, um, their FBS was depleted um, of EVs, which is good for ultracentrification for 16 hours. Um, they routinely check for mycoplasma contamination. Um, and then they conditioned their media for 48 hours after the PTX had been added and taken away. Um, and then when they collected their media, they centrifuged it for 300 times G for 10 minutes, followed by 2000 times G for 20 minutes. And that was to remove the cellular debris. And then they filtered the supernatant through a 0.22 micrometer filter um, and then they ultra centrifuge, so high speed ultra centrifugation twice at 120,000 times G for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so what they show is um, an increase in the concentration of EVs from the T cells uh, compared to the control cells in A and B. And then from the Western blot, they basically just show that all the EVs are positive for uh, both the markers and negative for the calmexin marker. Um, I do believe ideally there would be three positive markers, um, but they did cover a cytosolic protein and a transmembrane protein, so that's good. Um, yeah, so overall, um, um, so they, I think that probably the major thing is that they're missing a image of a single vesicle so something like electron microscopy um, and then I'll touch on the um, percentage of cell death again so I think um, particularly if cells are undergoing cell death they could be releasing a lot of um, membranes and I think um, that could affect the EV output. Um, so I think they should have at least reported um, the cell death um, percentage. Um, one really minor thing um, was they termed the um, exosome fraction as 45 nano um, meters to 145, um, but it probably should just be small EVs, um, but that's pretty minor. Um, yeah. Um, no questions on the chat, but I have a question about, um, I agree with the cell death proportion. That it's interesting that they, they present the particles per mil. I'm twisting my head to try and read the graph, but particles <laughs> per mil rather than particles per viable cell. It'd be interesting to see that number. Totally, yeah. I went through these supplementary methods, but I couldn't, um, supplementary extra figures and stuff, but I couldn't find anything on it, so. Cool. Um, I will jump into figure three. So figure three, to cells maintain viability via the upregulation of MDR1 PGP. 
So the aim here was to assist the release of MDR1 PGP uh, from to cells to understand if this is the mechanism behind which they maintain their viability, so one of the mechanisms. Um, so what they did is they did a Western blot analysis of MDR1 um, and the whole cell lysate and EVs from the to cells versus the control cells. Um, MDR1 is just a multi-drug resistance protein um, that can export molecules, including tender therapy. So this would be a way that the cells would um, stay alive. Uh, so what they show is that the expression is higher, for the whole cell lysate, the expression is higher in the senescent cells compared to um, the control. And then when you look at the EV fractions, it seems like there is less of this protein in the TIS EVs compared to the controls. Um, so, yeah, um, they don't conclude, um, and then, sorry, they conclude that perhaps the senescent cells retain MDR1 um, and that is how they evade chemotherapy-induced apoptosis. Um, did anyone want to comment on the EV Western blot? Wait. I've seen better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was just typing in there too. I was just saying it looks a bit, oh, yeah. not really sold on it. And also did they measure one or both bands? Yeah. Yeah. It's quite oh yeah. Band. Yeah. Because it's the upper and the lower band. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not. I'm not overly convinced on that one. Yeah, it's it's odd the way that the uh, whole cell lysate's kind of positioned nicely in the middle, and then this one's skew whiffy. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I always hate it when they don't give an explanation for why there might be multiple bands, especially as um, uh, there, there's there's one band in the cells and two in the EV. Mm. I have a feeling that the two bands. The one is actually at a higher resolution, the magnification. The other one is zoomed in, and the other one is zoomed out. Ah, oh. yeah, which makes me wonder what they it's probably what why. Say. Yeah, yeah. The second one, the cal, uh, the mm. double staining one, mm. double banded one. I mean, uh, and there's a question about the loading controls. Um, yes, Conexin was used as a whole cell lysate loading control and CD63, because Carnexin is negative in vesicles, uh, CD63 was used as a control for the vesicles. And it looks mm -hmm. like they've normalized to that. Do, mm. we, do we know 100% that CD63 wouldn't change between the two cell conditions? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if there is a good... EV loading control, is there? No. It depends which EVs you want to look at. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so using CD63 is potentially excluding a whole lot of vesicles from the, the analysis, right? It's a, it's a really tough one because I think uh, I, I, what I've noticed with Westerns is you either load equal amounts, but then you lose some of your experimental variation of, of protein or you normalize using a vesicle marker and CD63 somehow has become this exosome marker. Uh, hmm. All right, should we move on to figure four? So figure four, to cells maintain viability via removal of key proteins in their EVs. So the aim here was to profile the proteome of TIS EVs and for the methods, they use mass spec to quantify the proteome of the TIS EVs compared to the control EVs. Um, I believe they normalize to the total protein concentration. Um, and so what they found, uh, what I haven't shown here is actually the table where they found 142 proteins were significantly overexpressed in the TIS EVs compared to the control EVs. And they were particularly interested in three of those proteins, which they validated here with a Western blot analysis. So we've got a Nexin A5, 
um, which is crucial for apoptosis and it has other roles in cancer, including metastasis and stuff. Um, alpha tubulin, which is directly target, targeted by PTX. Um, so this is a way for the cells to, um, yeah, so this is a way for the cells to evade chemotherapy basically. Um, and then NAK, ATPA, so this breaks down the ATP and then in their discussion they sort of theorise that this is potentially a way that the cells um, maintain max ATP levels um, so that they still have that their metabolic needs for the cells. Um, and then what they haven't shown here is also um, they found an increase in the SAS proteins or sorry phenotype which is the senescence associated secretory phenotype um, which I think that kind of validates the uh, senescence phenotype of the cells which is kind of cool um, yeah so I think I think it would have been kind of interesting to see the expression and the whole cell life date of the proteins particularly those three as well um, because perhaps this is, you know, more of a reflection that the cells are just producing more of these proteins, perhaps. I'm not sure, but it would have just been good to reference back to the whole cell life date. Um, and I think ideally because they are looking at um, proteins, um, you know, the look profiling the proteome, um, I guess ideally they should be they could be using something like a density gradient to really get get that purity of proteins. Um, yeah, yeah, that's all I have to say about it. Um, Kirsty, Kirsty asks, um, is there any reason why they've gone from CD sixty three to HSP seventy for the loading control? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a bit dodgy, isn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, at least it's just a way to show that they're using both of them, or I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a bit weird, actually. Mm. Mm. No, it's unusual. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in the Anexin A5. To me, that, you know, that smells of apoptosis. Mm. I can an X and A5 is that it's just a phosphatidyl serine binding protein. So, you know, vesicles supposedly have exterior phosphatidyl serine, which an exon will bind to. Mm. And so the position of that an exon would be interesting to know is that intravesicular or on the outside? Mm. And, uh, you know, where has it come from? Oh, of the whole cell, like the cells or the EDs? On the EVs because it can act as a clearance receptor. Mm. Mm. Is it just mm. sticky on the outside of them? Mm -hmm. Cool. I will jump to figure five. So um, this is pretty much the same um, aim as before. Basically, what they've done now is they've taken their proteomic profiling and they perform some pathway analysis to look at the common signaling pathways. So they used IPA ingenuity pathway analysis and the innate database. Um, and what they show in A and B is the enriched pathways for the TIS EVs and then in B for the control EVs. Um, for the EVs, this included the breast cancer, breast cancer SASMIN 1 regulation pathway which they've um, blown up in C. Um, and you can see there's a couple of proteins highlighted there. So they've got tubulin and PP1 and PP2A. Um, so um, the proteins PP1 and PP2A are involved in the regulation of specimens, ses which work to promote cell cycle progression. So by pumping out these proteins, this is a way for the cells to maintain cell cycle arrest. So potentially when PTX is removed, these guys say that 
they reckon the cells uh, just regulate the statin and the pathway to make up for that so that the cell can maintain their cell cycle arrest so they're no longer um, relying on um, PTX in the tubulin sort of pathway. Uh, and then in D, the uh, predicted function of 69 of the upregulated proteins in the test EVs can be traced back to proliferation and growth of cells. So they emphasize the point that the removal of these proteins um, from senescent cells through EVs um, might be a way for the cells to maintain their senescent phenotype. Um, I didn't really have any more comments to make about that. Um, there's a question about the methods on how they acquired the overrepresented pathway analysis, but I, I presume that's in the methods with p-values of enriched proteins. Yeah. Um, I think I think it's just yeah. Oh yeah. Potentially. I could quickly open that if you guys want. Okay, I'm not sure how I can do that. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure, sorry. I'm not sure how I can make it out of my PowerPoint to check. <laughs> That's all right. We'll continue. I'm sure it's in the methods. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Should we carry on to figure six? So triple negative breast cancer cells treated with PTX analog flu tax two release EVs containing flu tax two. Uh, so the aim here was to obviously understand if the TIS EVs uptake flu tax. Um, so this gives us an idea um, of whether the cells may export the chemotherapy. So what they do here is they again treat the Cal51 cells with 75 nanomolars of PTX for seven days, um, or they treat them with 75 nanomolars of PTX for five days, followed by 750 nanomolars of Flutex two for 48 hours um, and so they uh, say that the reason the concentration is a lot higher for flu tax two is um, based on the manufacturing recommendation um, and then they actually isolated their EVs using the exospin kit which um, combines size exclusion and precipitation so they didn't actually um, explain why they've changed to a different um, preparation method for the EVs, um, which I found kind of weird. Um, and so then what they did is they measured NTA size and concentration where they show the concentration of the EVs is the same across both the treatments um, and greater than the control, control EVs in D. Um, they only used um, one positive Western blot marker, CD63, and one negative uh, Western blot marker, Calnexin. Um, so I think because they are using a different preparation method, they really should do the entire validation process again. Um, so if they're also missing that a single vesicle image like using electron microscopy um, and then they validate the senescent phenotype just by using the one um, marker that indicates, indicates senescence so beta galactosidase and C um, and then an F and G um, that's where they have the fluorescence assay to look at the uptake of flutex 2 in um, EVs and you can see there's a slight increase and in that compared to the controls and the PTX treated alone. Um, yeah, so the only thing I had to say about that was 
um, just the different ED preparation methods, um, they really should explain um, why they change it. Um, and then they need to validate um, that they're actually looking at EVs again. I'm um I'm maybe not looking very carefully. Um my eyes are not working properly, but where's the, where's the bit where they show that the flu tax goes into the vesicles? How did they test that? So they don't. So ah. all I've got is that fluorescent assay. Right, so it goes into the cells. But it go, but your title says it releases vesicles containing Flutex 2. So how do they test for the Flutex 2? Um, so it's just a like fluorescent analog attached to that um, molecule. Mm. Um, but all they're doing is just measuring fluorescence and they're just showing that it, yeah, it's in higher the than. In the, in the, in the vesicles. Yeah, sorry, in the vesicles. Right but not by imaging, just like in a plate reader? Just on a plate reader, yeah. Cool. Oh, that, no, that is a, that's the, that's the EVs, it must be. I think F says it's the cells. Oh, sorry. Yeah. G is fluorescent oh, level. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, you're right there. Yeah, so it must be a, a plate reader difference here. It's kind of cool though. <laughs> But the but the different isolation method is weird. Um, I don't know why you would suddenly change the way you're isolating vesicles because this method is isolating a completely different population of vesicles. It, it looks to me like they're trying to say that their new population is exosomes um, as mm. opposed to EVs, oh. but I don't think they're sufficiently showing exosomes. <laughs> no, not at all. Especially if it's... Um, uh, precipitation and then size exclusion that's really no different to um, spinning them down. It's a no. different vesicle population. So, is, is it not to that, get rid what? of? Sorry. Oh, sorry, go, go on, Colin. I may have missed it, but is it not to get rid of non EV associated fluorescence? That there's like free, so they're trying to clean up the background? Possibly, yeah. I mean, yeah, possibly. It depends what size this analog is. I mean, I would imagine that it'd be quite tiny. I think it's quite big. Um, it's like, because I looked up the structure um, <laughs> and it kind of looks... It's dedicated. It looks, they actually have it in their supplementary figures. Um, I should have actually put it on here, but um, it was quite sizable. So that would... Because they also, like the concentration that they use of that analog is a lot more, it's 700, it's like, yeah, mm. 10 times more. So. so SEC probably would have cleaned it out a bit better than differential centrifugation would. Um, um, uh, Bianca's asking a question, is there an advantage to using the exospin versus SEC? It's just an off-the-shelf mm. kit, isn't it? What is the goals, maybe? Yeah, it's just, it's convenience. Just, it's, yeah, it's convenience. It's just a precipitation afterwards, um, which isn't. I it wouldn't probably be much different to Bianca. Remember when I tried made you try to use the precipitation reagent, but um, it gave us much worse results in ultracentrifugation after. SS yeah, yeah. So it's it's basically just like a much quicker way of concentrating them down afterwards. Is that? Yeah, that's okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Although, although we've had, we've done some of that. And, uh, when you do these precipitations afterwards, it really go goops them up. And I think really precipitated vesicles should only be used for, um, molecular analysis. And, and I suppose this sort of is, it's kind of, you know, for essence goop for molecular, but yeah, yeah, we we haven't been huge fans when we've used it, but I know that some groups do like it and find it useful for certain contexts. Cool. So, I guess seven. Um, so, figure seven, treatment of CAL-51, triple negative breast cancer cells 
with the exosome biogenesis inhibitor GW4869. Um, so the aim was to understand the effects of partially inhibiting exosome biogenesis. So what they did is they treated their Cal51 cells with 75 nanomolars of PTX for seven days. Um, and then the um, exosome biogenesis inhibitor for 48 hours after that. Um, and so what they show in A is the beta galactosidase assay, uh, where you can see a slight decrease in the um, PTX treated cells with the exosome, exosome inhibitor. Um, and then for B, uh, we're looking at the NTA concentration. So there's no significant differences there. Um, you can see potentially a slight trend towards a decrease in the cells treated with the inhibitor, including the um, control cells. Um, but I think this is probably in, indicative of the efficiency of the exosome inhibitor, um, but I'll come back to that. Um, and then in C, we've got the Western blot um, of P21 and the whole cell lysate. Um, and they use they then use alpha tubulin as their loading control for the whole cell lysate, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then in um, and then they've also got the EV Western blot here of CD63 and Calnexin. And D and E, we've got the proliferation assay. So they did a really simple trifin blue cell count. Um, and the cells treated with the PTX are not proliferating nearly as much, which is expected. Um, and then they've zoomed in on the PTX treated cells um, to show that the ones inhibited with the exosome biogenesis inhibitor um, proliferate slightly less. Um, so these guys then go on to describe that this is the um, proliferation recovery, um, which I haven't quite wrapped my head around, um, but it's interesting. Um, and then they propose a model. So they've proposed um, that the majority of cells, when they're treated with PTX, undergo apoptosis. Um, in contrast, the ones that undergo therapeutic-induced senescence. Um, they maintain their viability by upregulating MDR1 um, and exporting chemotherapy and then releasing various proteins, um, including annexins and ATPases and tubulins through their extracellular vesicles to maintain their senescent phenotype when PTX has been removed. Um, yeah, so I think um, for this figure, um, I think they could have either used a slightly better model for the um, inhibition of exosome biogenesis because um, in B it's quite obvious that there's really not much of a decline um, in the number of exosomes or EVs. Um, or what they could have done is um, sort of more specifically looked at the small EV fraction. Maybe that would have made that difference um, clearer. Um, yeah, um, that was pretty much all from me. Do you, do you think any optimization of that in terms of dose or time frame would have improved the inhibition with the uh, GW4869? Yeah, um, potentially. I can't, I don't actually know what dose they use for uh, the... Um, five micromole. Yeah, I don't know what the standard is. I've never used it. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I want, surely they would have tried using um, mm. a higher concentration because you would really expect even just in the control cells for there to be a reduction in the total amount of EVs. Um, so yeah, I'm not too familiar with that um, inhibitor, but there's definitely other ways you could it could also come down to the isolation method that they used and just the fact that what they're isolating is an exosomes. <laughs> it's True. physicals. Yeah. The so, difference between the two isn't going to be a lot because 
you're isolating populations of these calls. So I wonder if they were using the ultra centrifugation here, potentially they would have seen that difference. But. Yeah. Well, Journey, Journey says uh, five micromoles, pretty standard for literature. Hmm. So yeah, maybe, maybe the population just isn't, isn't, uh, these isn't exosomes or not a lot of them. Who knows? Any more questions? Chat's pretty quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We can. Um, Annabelle, do you find it weird that they've referred to apoptosis sort of in their diagram, but they haven't looked at at all in their research? Yeah. So, because um, I think I guess they just did that really simple trifan blue like viability assay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Because did they actually use the term? apoptosis in their text I think they did um so yeah that that's a good point um they really should have done a proper apoptosis assay so yeah cool um if there's nothing else we can come back to the objectives um so I think I think um, they've sort of begun to characterize the EVs in terms of their protein content. I'm trying to be very careful here. <laughs> um, and their concentration. I think, I think it's pretty convincing that um, the, you know, there's more EVs released. I think they did a good job with that. And I, I think they did a good job with the model. I think um, the senescence model was like pretty compelling. Um, but I think they probably need to go a bit further in terms of validating their extracellular vesicles um, and yeah, finding a better way of EV, EV inhibition or using ultra centrifugation instead of the exospin column, um, yeah, exospin kit or yeah. Cool. Um, I just jotted down like a few um, future ideas or future papers that they could do. Um, so I think they, first off, they should really um, validate in another cell line, um, so another triple negative breast cancer cell line or something similar, um, perhaps um, a primary tumor one, um, P53, uh, P53 mutant one or um, something that, so there's some differences there. Um, I think they could look to characterize the different EV subtypes um, by separating out the different fractions, including the non-EV fractions. I think that would be quite interesting um, to see where the function is coming from um, most strongly. Um, they could look to complement their loss of function studies um, by stimulating exosome biogenesis or EV biogenesis. Um, and they could uh, look to uh, look at the effect of conditioning the EVs, having conditioned EVs to the senescent cells and treat them, um, treat non-senescent cells with those EVs or um, perhaps non-malignant cells that are found in the tumor microenvironment. I think that would be quite interesting, but I think it's still pretty cool um, what they've started to do there. So yeah. Any other comments? Chat is very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so are, are you planning to get onto some of that when you get back in the lab, Annabelle? <laughs> Given me some ideas of what not to do and what to do. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> that was very good, Annabelle. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was fantastic, Annabelle. Thank you very much. Can I just ask everyone while you gathered, the, the question that came up around uh, markers that we can use to normalise in vesicles, um, has anyone got any thoughts on that? Or have you seen anything that is potentially better than uh, 
the markers that these guys have used or that we might otherwise use. Stunned silence. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that's a no, Larry. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was figuring that was a convincing no. <laughs> I mean, personally, I've so far avoided trying to use anything as a loading control and just using Western blots for presence absence measurements rather than looking at increase or decrease in protein. But I think that that strategy is not going to always serve us. So um, if anybody does come across any good ones, we'd be more than happy to hear about them. Mm. It's a it's a really it's a really tough one. You see different papers using different loading controls, different loading methods. Uh, you know, volume versus protein quantity. I think it just depends on your question, but I don't think any of us have any answers. Um, we we do have a whole bunch of antibodies that have been optimized by Vanessa um, to try and help people test them test them out. Um, so if anyone wants to know what they are and the conditions, then we can share those, but we don't have any answers with how to actually do any of it. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Annabelle. That was fantastic. Um, thank you, Kirsty, for, for um, volunteering Annabelle to do that. That was brilliant. Um, and I hope that you have all enjoyed um, today's meeting. It's, it's just, if nothing else, a distraction from sitting and doing what you were otherwise doing, uh, which is very welcome. Uh, but actually, it was a great presentation and an interesting paper. And you highlighted some interesting problems that we all suffer from in the field. So thank you again, Annabelle, for doing that. So our intention, I think, at the moment during... Um, lockdown level four or whatever we're in is to do this on a weekly basis. You might want to jump in and help me out here, um, Cherie or Anastasia. Yes. Yep. Uh, and so, yeah. So um, I think we have recorded this session, Anastasia. Yes, yep. we did. So, so we will um, post that um, on our website uh, as a starting point. And uh, you're welcome to look back at that if you want to and invite other people to also look at that. And I look forward to seeing you all hopefully again next week. Um, I think we have volunteered Colin. Is that right, Colin? Yeah, I'm going to talk about, talk about chips. So I've linked the, the paper in chat. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a particle separation chip. So it'll be quite different. But if you want to have a look beforehand, feel free. Yeah, so Colin always gives a brilliant presentation on these uh, microfluidic chips. They're fascinating and they're going to become important tools for us in the future. Not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a great Easter. Stay home. Stay safe. Keep away from that virus. And see you all next week. Thank you. Everybody. Have a nice Easter. Bye. 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 Bye.